I'm a professor in animal in, in uh, biosystems engineering, so I'm trained as an engineer and I uh, did a lot of research in my career on uh, environmental issues in livestock, cows, pigs, poultry. And in time, I switched more to well welfare issues and other sustainability issues. And uh, I will show a little bit of my work of the last ten years, uh, which well focuses on the focuses on design of new, more sustainable uh, livestock s systems. Well, um, to show a little bit where we come from, um, what my talk will oh. ah, I have to get you. Ah, so, this is your perspective. This is America, and just have some idea where I come from. This is the Netherlands, and you see how small it is. Um, if we put it in numbers, um, okay, well, um, one more, I'll just, just one slot less. I think that would be much easier. If you look at some numbers for Canada, USA, and the Netherlands, when it comes to cattle, pigs, and poultry numbers, but also the number of people, 30 million, up more than 300 million, and the Netherlands is about 17 million people uh, in the area, then you'll see that where it all comes together is with the, pe the people density is, is rising from 3 to 30 to more than 300, so it's a factor 100 higher than Canada. But even, for example, if you look at the poultry stocking density, I just picked out one, it's less than 20, more than 200, and over 2,000. So I have some idea of, well, how intensive we are in the Netherlands. One interesting fact is, for example, that this figure means that the international level for rural area is 250 people per square kilometer. So in fact, it means the Netherlands has no rural area. And that's what we call Metropolitan Agriculture, um, we, well, quite a research program was, had, we had been running on that topic, urbanized uh, in that environment, not as a, as a threat, but as a chance. How, what, how, how can we produce food in such an environment? And does that thing to do with all this public and uh, social, societal wishes and demands? Well, even for us, it's much more critical because we're not only feeding Dutch people, but also we export more than 70% of our products. Uh, we call it export, but it's not going farther away than London, Berlin, or Paris. So it's it's so sometimes less than 100, sometimes two or three, four hundred kilometers. So uh, that's not so far away, but for us, it's still uh, export. Well, a few words about Wageningen University. We used to be an agricultural university when I studied there, and we changed to a University of Life Sciences. Uh, to, and our mission is to, to explore the potential of nature to improve the quality of life. And we're not only anymore in food and food production, as is here, but also in lifestyle, livelihood, and the living environment. And the uniqueness is here is that the university is very closely connected to the research institutes where in total about, well, you can see about 6,000 people are working on these themes. Organized in uh, about five science groups, uh, disciplinary groups, which uh, cooperate quite intensively more and more. Well, to say a few words about sustainability, one of the definitions or, well, descriptions was used in, in Wageningen many times is the one used by Brundtland uh, from the United Nations meeting the needs of the present generation without compromising the ability of future generations. Or I've read quite some work from William McDonough, uh, the man from cradle to cradle, he put it in other words, how do we love all children of all species for all time? Um, so, what's our responsibility as, as the current generation? And the question is, of course, what is at stake and who are the stakeholders? Well, a typical list in the Netherlands and in Europe would consist of this, these things. You see animal welfare and health, uh, veterinary and zoonotic diseases, of course, uh, environmental issues, local things, global uh, issues, greenhouse gases, uh, renewable resources. One of the issues that, well, I haven't heard yet is, is the 
in 30 to 50 years time it's expected that the phosphate um, sources will be uh, run out uh, or, or it will be much more difficult to get enough phosphate to feed our plants uh, and that's a threat to animal agriculture of course too Product quality, labor, succession, who's in charge in the, in the, in the food chain, uh, the, the countryside, the rural areas, of course, important. Uh, and also, in Europe, the North South discussion. So, what does our activities have an effect on, well, people in Africa, what products uh, they, they produce there? Well, of course, um, it could be a clear list, however, we should be very well aware that these things de depend, the way you put the, the critical level depends on place, culture, time, perceptions, and things are in the, here in America different as, than in Europe and are different than in uh, Africa or Asia. So we can compare systems uh, based on greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram product, but we are more and more aware that behind such a comparison, uh, we, we should be careful not to say, okay, this is a better system than that, and meaning that. Uh, the other ones should adapt or should change to another system uh, especially in uh, Africa and Asian systems we know that animals for example have much more functions than only uh, produce uh, food for the people they are also, also uh, their banking system uh, it's, it has to do with their status the, uh, the social role of animals etc so comparison is uh, well can, can be tricky well, something about social issues. Um, we first of all to say we have a very unique situation in the Netherlands. We have a party in Parliament that's called the Party of the Animals. So there's a party fo focusing typically only at animal rights. So that's uh, it's not an NGO. It's embedded now in, uh, in our political structure. Uh, and they made this film, Meet the Truth. That's all. also about the comparison between greenhouse gas emissions of Hummers versus uh, a kilogram of meat. Um, livestock Long Shadow, of course, and pictures like this. And regional initiatives that say, we don't want more manure in our region. Well, when did the discussion start in the Netherlands? And that's more or less comparable to, put to Germany and, uh, and Great Britain. To have some idea, Europe is, is, is well, uh, very diverse. I think the most critical consumers are um, in the northwest of Europe. That is uh, Finland, Denmark, the Netherlands, UK, Germany. That's the northwest region where, well, issues, uh, societal issues play a major role. And when it started in the Netherlands was actually in 1997, uh, when we had the big pig pest and about um, well, a couple of millions of pigs were, uh, were killed. And to have some idea, what happened was that people saw pictures like this, pigs being handled by cranes and put in trucks. At, at that time, it was a well, a huge rumor. But if you look at the list, it was followed by diets in the feet, the food and mouth disease, uh, hormones, even influenza in 2003. That had a huge impact because you can imagine if you kill about 30 million uh, birds. Uh, and you have all these restrictions on transport, and not only transport of pigs, of, of, of poultry, but also of humans, that it, in a small country like us, it has a huge impact. Um, well, recently we had the blue tongue, Q fever, I think you call that Jonis, I think. Uh, Jonis. Jonis, sorry. <laughs> nope. uh, and just recently we have now discussed about the methicillin resistance uh, uh, bacteria uh, causing control problems for health in the, in the animal uh, in the hospitals and this this list uh, well makes societal groups very very critical uh, they say should we, should we go on on the way we are going? You can't argue, or it's very hard for us to argue, oh, with some small adaptations, we will tackle the next issue. 
Um, it's such a long list that to say, okay, but probably there's something fundamentally wrong with what we're doing in, the, in animal husbandry in the Netherlands in the way, in the way we produce food. Uh, and not only the way, but of course, people get more and more critical and they say, probably we should, we should eat less uh, animal products uh, too. So, also, another picture with cows. And you can imagine that such pictures, well, that really upset people. This can't be the way we treat animals. When we look a little bit ahead, and we had some, uh, some pictures about well, the world population, but if you look at where to go when it comes to sustainability, where, st where should we go? Uh, we did some uh, foresights, uh, and this one is already from some 10, 15 years ago. When it was predicted, well, it was about when we, the world population was about 5.5 5, 5 billion people. If that would grow, it was a factor two. The environmental load is already a factor two, too high. And if the prosperity worldwide will grow with a factor five, so probably not in the rich countries, but especially in the developing countries, that would mean that two times two times five would mean that we have to reduce the environmental load per unit of prosperity, per unit of what we, what we consume, has to be reduced by a factor 20. And if you, well, if you let these things come to you, it makes you aware that with, with small adaptations, uh, we probably won't make it, especially not if you're, well, this is only when it comes to environmental issues, for example, the use of energy to produce things, or the, 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 um, the emission of ammonia, or the loss of nutrients. But compare that to animal welfare, if in the long run, if you look what, what issues are there on the agenda, are we, is it possible to solve that with small adaptations to our current uh, production system? Well, um, that brought us to well, what we did in our research project the last 10 years, and that was financed by the Ministry of Agriculture. They said, uh, they, they financed us, and they said, you have to, well, where are we going in the long run? And one of the things we did is we incorporated a lot of social sciences connected to us, to, uh, because we were people, animal scientists from the animal sciences group. And one of the things we did is, well, how does innovation take place? Um, it's opt optimization, which gives a small effect, then we can have product and process innovation, and there's also something like system innovation. Um, and system innovation has to do with rethinking functions and needs. Um, it's redesign, it's reflection on the inevitability of uh, standards and practices, decoupling of wicked links, redesign, and in effect think, well, how would such things, um, uh, how can it happen? Well, to put it in a picture, uh, you get this, that on the x-axis is time, here's the relative effect, that optim optimization yeah, will give in the end probably an effect of uh, factor two, improving a process innovation of factor five, but system innovation, it will take a quite a long time, but in the end, it's possible to reach a much higher, have a much larger effect. Uh, well, there's a lot of theory behind this, but what we did with our project is how can we get on this blue line for the longer run, for well, more sustainable uh, production systems and uh, production and, and uh, food food uh, chains. To give some examples, um, what we well, what can be seen as system innovations is uh, steam engines, the transition from horses to cars and tractors, from coal to gas, contraceptives, uh, analog to digital, and it means it's not only technology; it's it's uh, their new techno technological pieces, but also cultural, economical, and political changes are taking place, uh, and. Uh, and that's changing the landscape. So it's in the long run, there's a huge change. And it goes so gradually that we hardly perceive that. Um, but in the end, things really change things. Imagine like the mobile phone, the cell phone, how would that change your life? It's only a piece of technology, but it has a huge impact how we communicate, how young people communicate. So that's, uh, that changes our cultural ways of acting. 
So in our project, how can we deliberately strive for system innovation and transition in animal husbandry and to attain this integral sustainability? Well, we took um, an approach it's, and we call it the reflexive interactive design approach and the, the basis is design. Not only, normally if you're talking about design, you design something which is to be made. So you, you design a product or a system and with the single goal in the end to, to, be, uh, to, to have it uh, produced. However, in this case, um, it's much more a vehicle for, process, for, for the process of change and also for communication. So it's not only, uh, and that's is some, also here, is that it's, um, it's a holistic approach with long-term goals, including the societal issues of uh, people. Um, and uh, it's a, in the system analysis, it's, it focuses on the wicked link. So where, why can't we use within our current system come to uh, higher sustainability? For example, if we want to improve welfare, most of the times it means we have to give more space to the animals, and that directly means that within the current system, costs per animal and so the costs per product per kilogram of product are rising. So that's that's what we call a wicked link. If I do this, there's a side effect, mostly negative, and that's that, and that bothers us. That is uh, working against us, and that's what we have to break through in design. Design is basically breaking through these wicked links. Make a new design where I don't. Uh, uh, have these wicked links. It's also reflexive, um, and we do it with interactions with stakeholders. Um, well, and in, in the end, well, it, it starts with the, the, the identification of needs and based on of, of stakeholders, of needs of animals, for example, or needs of citizens, consumers, or the needs of the environment, if we could say so, and transfer that into a brief of requirements. Well, to put it in a, in a scheme, so we start also with a, a system and actor analysis, then we have a design phase and an anticipating niche and structural change, because in the end we want to be effective in practice. It's not for the books, but we want, the, the single goal is to have an effect in practice. And we want to do it with people, so uh, though we are financed by the Ministry of Agriculture, uh, they well, urge us, and that's what we want to, also based on uh, the, the theory and, 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 and knowledge and experience of other uh, people, to do it with people. So this all phases are done with critical parties, actors in, for example, the poultry sector, uh, the dairy sector, or whatever. And we address those people who might be important uh, for the first uh, steps uh, in practice, who, who could help us to build something new. Well, this is a little bit about engineering design. It's taught at many technical universities, and uh, it helps you in a more structured way to uh, come up to good solutions. And this is what you actually want. This is a wicked link. If we improve welfare, this bottle is full, but it, we have less benefits, economical benefits, and there will be a negative costs for, uh, for nature, or if we improve... Uh, uh, for example, we have less emissions, it, it will have a, a cost effect. And breaking through these wicked links is, of course, well, get rid of these this problem of commun communicating bottles that you have welfare, economics, and also uh, environmental aspects uh, well addressed. Oh, well, this goes too quick. So, I'll come to one example I will show you. Uh, it's called Houden van Hennen. It means laying and husbandry. But uh, the, the interesting part of this title is that Houden van also means loving. So it has a double meaning in Dutch. Um, and it aims to strive for new designs for laying hands. We started this project in 2003. It's already some years ago. Um, uh, and in 2003 also, the uh, avian influenza breakout came along in the Netherlands, so it was a very, very interesting period. We're talking about table egg production. Um, in this case, this is with an outdoor run. Uh, 
And at that time, um, um, we were in a phase that, I think in 1999, the EU uh, uh, set a directive that we have to abandon the battery cages uh, per the 1st of January 2012. So at that time, more than 90% of the hands were still kept in cages. So and one of the questions of the Ministry was, where do we have to go? Aviaries had been developed, uh, were also a little bit in practice, maybe uh, put probably 10% of our hands, and we talk about 30 million laying hands, uh, but there were still many questions about the, the well, sustainability of... Uh, uh, let me see if this is running. Yes, it is. Um, typical problems were welfare and health, of course, in of laying hands in... Um, in aviary systems, economics, environmental issues, influenza, of course, uh, when, when the chickens are having outdoor access. Um, at that time, also, peak trimming was an issue. Uh, still, it is a, there's not a directive yet, but at that time, we expected to have a directive on it within a couple of years. Uh, but still, it is allowed. And one of the typical is the image of, of free range systems, but also of well aviary systems. Well, so these were the problems that were identified. Um, but what we do in our projects is interesting. We try to turn things around. So not what are the threats, but also look what could be the potential uh, benefits. Uh, can we balance welfare and health? How could we produce in a sustainable way? How could a farmer make more profit out of uh, farming? Uh, how could farmers be uh, more, uh, more proud on their production? And how could we have happy hands? And how, how can we stop the public debate? Well, so, um, quite some challenges there. Um, what we did is, uh, these projects run for about, well, normally about two years, uh, where a lot of people are working, and it takes quite some time. In this project, we had three main actors, so we wanted to have the best welfare for the laying hands, so we draw up brief requirements, what, is, what are the needs of the laying hands to fulfill all natural behavior, uh, and come to the need of food, drinking, resting, foraging, egg laying, etc. What does a hand need for that? Uh, without beak trimming, uh, of course. Secondly, where the farmer, what are the needs and the wishes of the farmer? How does he want to keep his hands? And thirdly, what are the wishes and demands of the society? And we did, I think, two breakthroughs. Up to then, all our colleagues from the social science group, they did a lot of inventories by means of paper, words. And they asked people a lot of things. What appears is that wording of, of, of things, uh, it can be helpful, I'm saying you shouldn't do it, but what I will show you is that visuals, drawings, uh, have much more meaning uh, for, for, for people than, than words. So that was one step, and we didn't ask them negative things, but we asked them, what is your ideal image on laying an osprey? What is what you want? What is your ideal? We did that with uh, three, met three mentality groups. Mentality is a, uh, a distribution. Well, it's a, there are eight mentality groups, uh, and it's not only based on income, but also based on value system of people. Well, we've heard that yesterday, today, before more. The values of people uh, discriminate them how they act, how they think, but also in the end how they buy products. And this is, I want to show some more details about it, because this is very interesting to see, is that, uh, because these pictures uh, give you some ideas how people think, what they want, what they like, what could be solutions, uh, but also, it will also show you that, based on these drawings, you can see that different societal groups uh, have different clues. Uh, think in a different way, and that means that you can address them with different things to buy different products. Well, first of all, we're the post-materialists. Um, this is a group with a relatively high income, and they really trust on, um, uh, on, on facts and figures. 
And what you see is, this is a typical drone, they come up with quite intensive system. So, uh, a, a multi-tiered system, quite intensive. Uh, this is a kind of a flat. This is also a stock system. Uh, and what they express is, and what they also express in words is, the welfare and the environmental issues should be addressed in the right way. So it should be okay. And if science, scientists can prove that, we are fine. And if you put these hands and you, if you can do that in a quite intensive system, it's fine for us. And so we are, um, uh, we think it's important, but we, we don't care so much about how it exactly would look like. So intensive is a fine, uh, but it should be addressed and it should be, should be controlled. The second group is what we call the traditional bourgeois. Uh, and they have typical romantic views eh, expressed here, like uh, the castle, which expresses a safe house, eh, so where the chicken is uh, very safe, is not threatened by things from outside. Uh, or what you see here and there is a typical farmyard uh, with 10 or 20 uh, laying hens. Uh, as their ideal image how to produce table eggs. S small scale, uh, a strong link to the past. Um, well, I think that's, that's what they express. That's what, our, what their ideal is. Then the third group, that's a very interesting group. These are the cosmopolitans. And these people, um, they, uh, you see here very nice pictures of our what we call our Ferrari laying hen, uh, or on a motor, or roller skating, or in a in a fun park. Uh, it expresses dynamic life and privacy. And these people really respond, what do you think how a hen should live? A hen should have a life like I have. I want to have a dynamic life, uh, safe in my own house, but when I'm not at home, I want to have fun. Uh, I should have a good life. Uh, and that's, well, they, they really transpose their way of living and what they think is good for themselves, transpose to the animal. Um, and that's very interesting to see. And especially these pictures, when we show these pictures to uh, when we came out, you can imagine that we, we got a lot of criticism, uh, especially from farmers, but also from uh, other parties and uh, companies uh, within the laying hand sector. They said, this is ridiculous. How many money did you spend on this? That was the first question, of course. <laughs> uh, and you can't be serious, Peter, this is rubbish. <laughs> Etc. Etc. And then I said, it all might be, but these are your consumers who react and think in this way. It's not my. I'm. I'm free of this. It's your consumers, and these are three typical groups who are mostly interested in in how we produce food. So the other five are less interested. So that's why we choose these three. And slowly, during well, the time after that, they 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 changed and. There is very much difficulty in, in interpreting these, 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 these graphs and these pictures because when we show a Ferrari hand, it doesn't mean that we should have hands in a Ferrari, but it's, it's, a, it's an expression how they think. So how can we give a hand a dynamic life? How could we, in all, how could we search for other solutions that we can make it for them uh, well, reasonable and uh, um, convince them that well, we addressed their 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 ideals. And also here, what's interesting to see is here, so you see here is typical, there's the dynamic life, and here is the, the safety of their own home. So every chicken has its own uh, cage, which can be opened, so they can have their own locked, uh, well, their own safe house. So, what, we did, what, do, what did we do with that? Because this was one of the three parts of our study, and we wanted to come up with designs. And we came up with two designs, the roundel and the plantation. This is the design we made. Um, uh, and one of the things I have to address is that we had a huge debate on, on, on the uh, necessity of an outdoor run or not. Uh, because an outdoor run, at that time, you can imagine that, well, the avian influenza, the big issue was, of course, it is caused by the birds having an outdoor run, which are, well, affected by uh, the free birds, etc. So, yes or no, an outdoor run was, was quite critical. 
And this is a design uh, with an outdoor run, but not but co but a covered one. So you see, what you see here is a round house, and you see in this case it's uh, I think it is about eight uh, uh, units. Where there's here's an, um, a foraging and uh, and uh, scratching area. These are this is for dust bathing, and here are the the, 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 the nests the, the, for the, for egg laying. Uh, also food and water supplied here, and also the, the resting areas here. And here in the outer ring, there's a, also an, an additional um, dust bathing area. Well, typically for the natural environment, for the uh, to give hands. Uh, a really possibility for well, in, under green shrubs, uh, small trees, uh, perform their natural behavior, and also for the view, the outside view. This part is uh, covered. This part is also covered, but there's a, a lot of uh, light coming in, and the outside uh, is uh, is not closed, but there's uh, wire uh, nettings, so that. Natural elements eh, like the weather, the wind, uh, temperature changes can enter uh, this area, eh, whereas this area can be more controlled uh, in terms of temperature. So that's one design. It's about for 30,000 laying hens, um, and the stocking density is about uh, five hens per square meter. So that's uh, uh, 2,000 square centimeters per hen. If you compare that a little bit to aviaries, there we have nine hens per, per, per square meter of living area. And if you compare to battery cages, there are, it's, well, depends a little bit on the country, but it's um, around something, I think so, somewhere around 500 square centimeters per hen. So uh, it's about four times higher than a battery cage and half of uh, our current aviaries. And we think, based on the literature, that uh, these stocking densities was, was a good uh, uh, design of the living environment without deep beaking we can have uh, no problems we, we can do without problems uh, with uh, feather packing and uh, no problems with uh, cannibalism so this is one design this is the second one the plantation which is a much more even, even more natural area whereas these are houses and there are houses uh, with a kind of indoor area which can be closed, so normally it's open, but it can be closed with special uh, curtains in case of uh, well, threats uh, for diseases from outside. And this is typically a very natural area, and also, what you can see here better, is that hens also have access to other areas uh, besides, for example, with uh, trees or other uh, arable products where they also can uh, use as, a, as an outdoor run. But it can be closed. Stocking density is also the same, but it's a much more natural uh, approach uh, and, uh, and image. Well, um, there's a nice movie on the internet, on YouTube, so if you search for this, um, you can watch it yourself. It's, uh, most of our products are uh, also available in English, so you're welcome to, uh, to look for that. <laughs> Some key uh, elements, well, the space, of course, the differentiation in the functional areas, the foraging is very important for the laying hand, so a lot of space is, uh, uh, is there for, uh, for foraging and, and, and scratching. The discussion about the outdoor area, and with this design you can produce products for certain market where, where consumers can see, okay, it's produced in that way, and that gives me convinces me of, well, the things that I think are important when I buy a product. Well, in the end, it's important to say that these were not blueprints. We didn't design them to break or say, okay, this is the way how we should in the future produce X. No, they were meant as uh, leading uh, pictures, as, um, as, fu as future visions, more or less to say, to inspire people or to start a debate or whatever. Uh, there were, de de they were uh, designed in, in much detail, so when it comes to space requirements, etc., things are, were okay. We, we calculated many things. But, um, but people had to get used to the idea, because up to then, our role as scientists, also as, uh, as Wageningen you are, we were the ones 
who were there to well to design uh, the animal house for the future. So there's one solution for the whole future for all farmers in the Netherlands. And in this case, we said no. There might be more possibilities, and probably we don't know exactly what is the solution, but we can give you a leading threat. We can give you some idea. Um, and that's, that was quite a new role for us, and, also, and well, most of the parties didn't understand that. But you can imagine that when we came up with these two designs, um, uh, the directions ranged from very positive to very critical. Uh, to give you one uh, expression of a farmer, he says, uh, this, this has nothing to do with... Uh, with, with hand farming or with, with poultry farming, this is a, a, a fun park for laying hands. So, <laughs> probably yes, it was because it was top welfare. So that's what he really ident identified in it. So, um, but then we, our goal was to have some effect in in um, in practice. So in the years afterwards, we uh, did a couple, couple of things. With interested farmers who came to us, we had about three to four or five farmers who came to us and said, well, I'm interested in that part or that part, or I want to build a new house and I'm interested to develop that part of your design. So we tried to get money for new uh, innovative projects. Not at our research farm, but in practice, so the farmers were the leading ones. Uh, and well, in terms of, uh, these were really the, 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 the early adapters who were the, the innovative people who were looking for new things and were willing to, to change and to, to, to try new ways of uh, keeping hands. And we formed some networks, but we had really difficulty to get things uh, going. Uh, for example, to get some money from stra for strange ideas, uh, that's uh, a very hard, hard job we uh, experienced. Um, and even sometimes when, when a farmer um, well, uh, one of the typical things is, is in innovation, the, um, the running cost may be not so much higher, but the risk is mainly in that, well, if uh, things go wrong, uh, your investment is, well, is, uh, is spoiled. So what to do with that? And that's one of the, the risks of a farmer are very difficult to finance, uh, we found out. So that's so we're really a mismatch between this type of innovation and all the subsidy uh, instruments we have in the Netherlands, and we had. Well, in the end, um, we were successful, happily. Um, one farmer, uh, was Chris Boren, he built a, uh, a new house uh, on his farm, the Langrenhof. He is, he is an organic farmer with 6,000 laying hens, and he built two new houses, one for rearing 6,000 laying hens, and one for uh, keeping uh, uh, 6,000 layers. So the breakthrough was that he reared his own hands because he was very convinced uh, the way his, his organic hands were reared to then was not the right way. He had much problems with his hands during the laying period and he said I want to do it in a different way. And one of the things he did is he gave the, 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 the day old chicks uh, birds, he gave them daylight access and uh, after a couple of weeks already access to, uh, to a scratching dust bathing area. Uh, and that was really breakthrough. Uh, no de-beaking of course because it's organic. Uh, and up to now he's very successful in that. It appears that when you take care very good, in a good way f for the rearing hands, it's, 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 it's possible to have uh, very little feather packing and no, uh, hardly no cannibalism during, uh, during the laying period. And that's a very, well, very important to have a very good connection between, well, the, the way you rear your hands and the, the way you keep them. Um, yeah, I think that's the most important issue here. So this is a farm with an outdoor run. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think that's, that's the most important thing. So this is a picture of the, uh, the inside. It's an, it's an aviary system, basically. Uh, with this, uh, where hens can uh, have resting places very much on top and water and feed is uh, supplied on these uh, tiers with uh, manure belts underneath and on the floor there is uh, a, a scratching area. And what you see here is a tube where um, grain or oats are uh, supplied to the hens for, uh, to uh, increase scratching. I 
I think yes, that's that. Well, this is the, our design of the, of the round hole, and in 2006, an egg trading company came to us, I said, and they said, I'm, we are very interested uh, to, to develop this further on. And that was interesting, because the marketing man from this egg trading company said, if you can produce eggs, huh, it's like the round hole, and you have, I can have a picture of hands scratching under trees and traps, I'm sure there's a market, a part of our consumers is prepared to pay a little bit more for eggs produced in that way. So in the end what happened, we uh, came up also with uh, Vancomatic, that's a very big uh, company who builds uh, aviary systems. At a certain time we, ma we made a maquette, it was, maquette was a very important uh, stage because with this one we went to local municipalities uh, to, uh, to, to have talks, but also to the uh, Society of, um, for the Protection of Animals to have discussions on this idea. Uh, and they could see it. It was not paperwork anymore, but they could see how are you going to build it. So it's still a roundhouse, but you can see there are modifications. Here's the aviary system, so that's the, 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 where they, the night period, and this is the day period, the daylight uh, area. Uh, and they could take it off, and they, we could exactly explain all the characteristics of the system. And that, with that, we got a lot of feedback from NGOs, but also from the ministry, also from the, uh, but also from consumers. We tested this, etc., etc. And also to, well, to, to inform farmers, because also we were searching for farmers who were interested to build such a house. Uh, but also local municipalities, because they had to give uh, uh, permits for environment, etc. So this was an important stage to, to make it visible for uh, for people. I'm, I'm, I mean. And this is the picture from last year, the 10th of April, where this house was opened. And what you see is that it's a, now it's a five uh, unit, uh, well actually six, six half units, but uh, the five units, this is where the aviary system is, where the hands stay during the night, where the feed and water is supplied, where the, where, with, with uh, tear wire floors for belts, uh, where they sleep, and where also the laying nets are. And if you have a look here, this is the... This, this area where they can forage and scratch and this, and this is the outer ring, you see a small piece of that uh, just here uh, the outer ring, there are shrubs and there's sand where they can dust bath, etc. And it's very open for the public because well, where, where I'm standing here for, for this picture that's where the public can see it uh, everybody can come to this farm uh, every day, anytime, anyhow and there's a lot of information um, and the interesting thing is, is that uh, that has to do with the Royal Society of the Society for Protection of Animals. They gave three three star uh, to this well, to this design, meaning that it's for them equal in terms of welfare, equal to organic. And here you see a laying hen with an unbeat, uh, uh, which is unbeat. So that's still in development, huh? but up to now we're doing pretty well. And just recently a second round of house was opened. And the eggs are being sold in a special contract to the supermarket, uh, Albert Heijn. And it's, so what's really interesting is that it's not only a new house, it's not only new technology, but also major breakthroughs were in, in the way uh, the, the chain is organized. So there's, the egg trading company up in the end uh, got out. But eggs are now direct packed on the farm, egg control is done there, and are directly uh, transported to the supermarket. The farmer gets a premium uh, for his eggs, uh, and also the way this contract is, is organized is, is very different than uh, up to now.